I don't, I don't feel pressure to conform. Yes. Most of my life, I guess. Yeah, every day. It depends, like, I mean, the other day I was in like, a bar, my friend wants to go to a club, I wanted to go home and sleep. So I went home and slept. When people look at me and I, and I don't feel comfortable, I feel stressful. For me, I don't really have any pressure to fit in anywhere. I do what I do 100% and I'm unshakable. People see you like someone else and they say, yeah, you're acting like him or like that. You just say no and I am who I am. At work? Yeah. Before it was with friends. Nowadays, uh, I'm just who I am. All the time I try to change the currents in my life. Most of the times I don't succeed, but it's fine. You know, I learn from, from that. I don't feel the need to conform to anyone. I never want to be different. I always want to blend in, you know. Good morning, New Life Church. Happy New Year. Like Hani said earlier, Pastor Hani, Happy New Year to each and every single one of you. And uh, I really pray that this will be one of the best years ever in your life. Year 2020. I still remember where I was and what I did when we went over to the year 2000. Can I see that hand? I put my computer off and everything. And... Uh, I was ready for this big dark hole to suck us in. And now we are 20 years later and God is still doing a great work in this world. Even though there are wars and rumors of wars, even though we don't have much lights on these days, but there is hope. And that hope is a life lived with Jesus. So I am excited. I'm truly excited about this year. Seeing 20, um, 2020 is not just, this is not just the first Sunday of 2020, but this is the first Sunday of this new decade. You've thought about that for a moment. And it's so awesome to be able to give the first Sunday of our new decade to the Lord. And that's why I see this message this morning actually being so profound and, and right on cue. But that's just how the Lord works. He's ready in and out of season. He's always on time. And um, this word is titled this morning, my sermon is titled, How Can I Make the Most of the Rest of My Life? See, we only get one life. We only get one life, and uh, you might wish for more, but you only get one. D.H. Lawrence said this. He said, if only we could have two lives, the first one in which to make our mistakes, and the second one in which to profit by them. But unfortunately, there is no dress rehearsal for life. You see, we're on the stage straight away. It's like walking onto this platform and you have no idea what you're going to say or what you're going to sing. And obviously, you're going to make mistakes if you don't necessarily know where you are going. But the question this morning is not about fixing the mistakes of our past, but the question is, is how can we make the most of the rest of our lives? How can you live a life of purpose? How can you live a life that is truly fulfilling? The good news is that God loves you. And I want you to hear that this morning, and I'm gonna say it a few times throughout this message. God loves you, and he has a great purpose for your life. He has a great destiny planned for you. And Paul describes how we can make the most of the rest of our lives in Romans 12, and, and Romans 12 will be our key passage of scripture this morning. Let's read together from Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of all that God has done for you, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I'm going to share this morning three points, three points that I believe we will receive from Paul's teachings here in Romans 12 and points that will help us to make the most of the rest of our lives. And point number one is what should we do? What should we do? And Paul says here in Romans 12, 
We need to break with the past. We need to break with the past. He says in Romans 12, verse 2, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. J.B. Phillips translates it in a little different way. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. You see, we are called to be different. As Christians, we are called to be different. And that is the challenge. There is a huge pressure to conform in this world. Let's be honest, this morning or this weekend, there is, if there's any pressure, it's pressure to be Christian because we're supposed to be in church. And well done for you who came to church this morning. But tomorrow when you go back to work, the pressure just shifts the other way. And it's hard. It's hard to be different. I found this story of a, a police officer who, um, a young police officer who wrote his police college exam. And um, the first three questions of his exam went very well and it was very easy. But then he got to question number four and it went like this. It said, you're on patrol in outer Johannesburg when an explosion occurs in a gas main in a nearby street. On investigation, you find that a large hole has been blown in the footpath and there is an overturned van lying nearby. Inside the van, there is a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. You recognize the woman as the wife of your divisional inspector who is at present away in the United States for business. A passing motorist stops to offer you his assistance and you realize that he's a man who's wanted for armed robbery. Suddenly, another man runs out of his nearby home shouting that his wife is expecting a baby and the shock of the explosion has made the birth imminent. Another man cries out for help, having been blown into an adjacent canal by the explosion and he cannot swim. Bearing in mind the provisions of the Mental Health Act, describe in a few words what actions you would take. Yeah. The officer thought for a moment. He picked up his pen, and this is what he wrote. He wrote, I would take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd. <laughs> yeah. I think that he is a super wise man. You see, church, that is the temptation. To take off our so-called Christian uniform and to mingle with the crowd. Just be like everyone else. But we are called to be distinctive as God's children. We are called to be different. And if you like, we're called to be a chrysalis rather than a chameleon. A chrysalis is a pippa that turns into this most beautiful butterfly. And a chameleon is a long-tailed lizard that changes color according to the background that he's on. So if he's on a brown tree, he'll be brown. And if he's on a green leaf, that chameleon's going to be green. And see, that is the temptation, to be a Christian in a Christian environment like this today. And as soon as we're not in a Christian environment anymore, to move into that different environment and to be like everyone else in that environment. See, that creates unnecessary tension for us. To be one thing in one environment and a totally different person in another environment. But God has called you and I to be different. We are not called to be odd. You and I were not called to wear odd clothes. We were not called to speak in a deeper voice when we receive Jesus. Or call everyone brother and sister even though they're not. We were all called to be normal. And if we look at the life of Jesus, he was the, one of the most normal people ever. He was one of the most fully integrated human beings who ever lived. So Paul says, break with the past and make a new start. Break with the past and make a new start. Maybe this morning you came to church and this is maybe your first time ever in a church building. Or maybe you have seen a friend or you've known a friend who, who has received Jesus into their lives and their whole lives have changed and their lives truly look so attractive. And you're thinking maybe in this new year I should give Jesus a chance in my life. But at the same time you think I'm not sure I want to become like that. And you're also unsure because what would it mean for you 
What changes would occur in your life? The point is this, that God is not going to ask you to leave the good things in your life. He loves you. And he wants the very, very best for your life. The thing that God's going to ask you to leave behind is the rubbish, so to speak, in your life. So you can take hold of all the beautiful treasures that God has in store for you for the rest of your life. It's a personal story of mine, and I've never spoken about it publicly, but my grandfather, he had a brother, a strange brother, who lived on the streets. In other words, he was a street person. He was a beggar. And my, brother throughout, my grandfather throughout his life was looking for his long lost estranged brother. And as, whenever he would drive throughout Johannesburg or wherever he went, he would be on the lookout. Look out for his brother. And one day he found him. He found his brother next to the street. He went to him and he invited him home. He invited him home with him. He opened his home to him. He gave him a room. He gave him food. He gave him a bath. He was a great guy. I fondly remember him being a little boy in my grandfather's home. And the one morning when my grandfather woke up, his brother was gone. His brother was gone. And he went back to the streets. And as, as you know, people who live on the streets, they like any other community. He had his friends there, and they were more like family to him than my grandfather was. And I was fascinated by this. And as a young boy, I went to my grandfather and I said, why would he go back to the streets? Look here, you've given him an opportunity for a better life. And this is what my grandfather said. He said, I guess he didn't want to leave behind the life he knew. I guess he didn't want to leave behind the life he knew. To me at the time, it was so bizarre, absolutely bizarre. I couldn't believe it. Why? Why would you go back to the streets? But as an adult today, I see so many people walking in the same posture, not wanting to leave behind the things they know because of fear. Fear. You see, Jesus offers life and life in all of its fullness to us. And unless we leave behind the rubbish, we can't enjoy the treasures that God has for us. And one of these treasures that Paul talks about in Romans 12 is sincere love. Sincere love. He says in Romans 12, verse 9 to 10, and you can read with me on the screen, it says, Love must be sincere. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12, verse 9 to 10. You see, the literal Greek word Paul uses here in this passage is anupokritos, which means without hypocrisy. And that is what they did in old Greek plays, is that they will put a mask on during the play. And that was called hypokritos. From where we get the word today, hypocrite. And in our lives, isn't it so easy to put a mask on? Isn't it so easy to just put the mask on and not show who you really are? Unfortunately, knowingly or unknowingly, social media has made it so easy for us to put a mask on. I don't know about you, but when last did you take a picture of yourself in your worst possible state? I'm sure if I go through every one of your Facebook or Instagram I won't see any photos of you on a rubbish dump, most probably in Mauritius somewhere. See, what we do is we take a photo of ourselves, and what we do is we get the best angle, right? Knowing that my left is my best angle. I don't know about you. Using the best lighting that I can, using the best filters on my new phone that I can. You see, the danger with this is if we live our lives like this, the danger is that our relationships and our friendships, they become shallow and superficial. And that's not what God has created us for, right? God has created us for meaningful relationships. When I finally understood this, 
I realized that if God can accept me the way that I am, with all my faults, with all my failures, then maybe I can accept myself. And when I realize that God loves me just the way I am, you know what? I can drop the mask and I can be myself and I can be the person that God has created me to be. Amen? See, then, then you can be authentic. Then you can be real. And that's what it means to be a human being who is loved by God. Oscar Wilde said this. He said, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. So next time when you look at someone, especially me right now in my current bodily form after this Christmas season, I just have to remind myself to be myself because everyone else is taken. You see, when people drop the mask, beautiful, meaningful relationships start to happen. We think that we'll impress people by our strengths, but I want to tell you this this morning, you connect with people through your vulnerability. We don't always have everything figured out. Another treasure that Paul talks about in Romans 12 is Romans 12 verse 11, and it's enthusiasm for God. This is what he says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Never be lacking in zeal. You see, when you've given your life to the Lord for the very first time, it is truly the start of your spiritual journey. It's not where it stops, it's where it starts. It's a bit like a honeymoon and a marriage. You can have a great honeymoon and a terrible marriage, hopefully not, or you can have a terrible honeymoon and a fantastic marriage. And just like in a good marriage, the relationship gets better and better as time goes on. And in the same way, our relationship with God is meant to get better and better and better and better and better and better as time goes on. That's what matters, the end goal. The Bible talks about us finishing strong in Hebrews 12. And that is what God wants. It's all about the long term. And God loves you and he wants the best for you. Talking about marriage this morning, marriage is an amazing gift out of the hand of God. It's one of the treasures that God has given us as his people is marriage. It also represents the union between Jesus, the bridegroom, and his body, the church, where one day we will be united and we will live in eternity with Jesus, the lover of our souls. So God gave us marriage. And I want to say this morning, God came up with the idea of sex. Think about it. It's his idea. It's God's idea. He's not surprised by it. He's not like looking down from heaven and saying, goodness gracious me, what are these guys getting up to? Right? I want to tell you this this morning, and I really, really would love for you to hear this. Pleasure is God's invention. Pleasure is God's invention. You know, the devil wants to distort and destroy everything that is good and beautiful in your life. The devil is a counterfeiter. And whatever God has created for good in your life, he comes and he counterfeits that good. He corrupts it for evil. And sex is God's idea, and it is a beautiful gift. And the Bible affirms our sexuality. There's a whole book in the Bible, the book of Song of Songs, and it talks all about the delight and contentment and satisfaction that it brings. The inventor here, God, the designer here, tells us how this beautiful gift is to be enjoyed to the full. You see, the biblical context is lifelong commitment within marriage. That's how you should use this gift. And Jesus quotes out of Genesis, and he says in Genesis 2 verse 24, he says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You see, there's this public leaving, but then there's also this gluing together. It's not just a physical and biological gluing, but an emotional, psychological, spiritual and socially, and that is the Christian context of this one flesh union that takes place. In this context, there is freedom, and there is enjoyment. It is exciting, and it is beautiful. It is the most positive view of sex and marriage that exists in the world. 
it's by far the most romantic as well. See, it was God's plan. It is God's plan. It is God's purpose. And the, des the designer God here says, here is this beautiful gift that I have for you, but don't mess it up. Don't mess it up because you can hurt yourself. It is so powerful. See, there's no such thing as casual sex because every act affects this one flesh union. It's like taking two pieces of corrugated, corrugated cardboard, one with the face of a man and one with the face of a woman, and sticking it together. And then what you do is you try to pull it apart. And the only thing that is left is damage. There is hurt. All around in our society, unfortunately, we see broken and hurt people. Broken men, broken women hurt because they use this gift in the wrong way. And that's what God doesn't want for you. God doesn't want for you to get hurt. It was never his intention for you to get hurt. And that's why he has given us this beautiful picture of how things can be and how things should be. The Bible says everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but by his grace, we are saved. And the good news today is that it's never too late to change our lives because God loves us. The society that Paul was writing to here in Romans were much like our own society today. It was one where God's standards wasn't kept and they really messed up and they were hurt and they were broken. But Paul never condemned them. If we look at Romans 12, there's no condemnation there. Romans 8 verse 1, Paul writes, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? He's saying, don't do it any longer. What is Paul saying? He says, break with the past. Whatever that thing is that you are struggling with, break with the past. We can always make a new start because God forgives us. Amen? Every day can be a new start. Today can be your new start. So the question is, how do we do it? Point number two. How do we do it? How do we make a new start and break the past? And Paul says, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Romans 12 verse 1. Now that's an act of the will. I have to willingly come and lay my body down. I have to willingly come to the Lord and say, I offer everything that I have to you, Lord, for the rest of my life. Giving all that I am. Giving of my time. See, we need to, you need to give God your time. See, time is the most valuable possession that we have. You can get more money, but you can never get more time. There are people with a lot of money in the world who fell ill, who would do anything to get more time. And it's amazing to see that when people receive Jesus into their lives, their priorities change. And it's so easy to get our priorities wrong. And I found this interesting article as I was preparing for this message. And um, it's a genuine article. It really, really happened. And this is what it said. It says, it was a farmer from Kenya. I don't know if we have any Kenyans in the house this morning. Maybe you saw this article. Um, but it's a Kenyan farmer who was looking for a wife. And he advertised in the personal columns of the East African Standard. And this is the advert he put in there. Nanyuki farmer seeks lady with tractor with view to companionship and possible marriage. Please send picture of tractor. <laughs> you see, it's very easy to get your priorities wrong in life, and I think this guy's priorities weren't in the right place. If you can hear an amen from the ladies this morning. But when you experience God's love and you have a relationship with God, your priorities change. You see, people become important to you. Your relationships become important to you. Not what you can get from them. Not their tractor, but they. They become the important thing in your life. God becomes the most important relationship in your life. And I want to encourage you this morning, seeing that it's the first Sunday of 2020, seeing that it's the first Sunday of this new decade, put God first in your life. Make a commitment today. Say, every day I'm going to spend a few minutes reading my Bible and praying. I promise you being in the presence of God will transform your life forever. See, a relationship is based on communication. And the same with God. He wants to have communion with us. 
He wants to talk to you through his word and through his spirit. But then also you need people. You can't just do it on your own. So maybe this year and this decade to come and the decades beyond, make Sunday a priority in your life. It's only an hour and a half of your week. And we come together like this. Just look at the person next to you. You can sit next to that amazing guy or, or lady. Hopefully it's your wife that you looked at. You can he- worship together. You can hear an awesome word like this one this morning. We pray for one another. We spend time, we fellowship together. This is how you keep a relationship with God going. This is how you keep zeal going. We should give God our ambitions. The question is, should Christians have ambitions? Or should Christians be ambitious? And Jesus' answer is very clear, and he says, yes, yes. He commands us to be ambitious. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. What Jesus is saying in this passage of Scripture is that don't make the secondary thing in your life your primary ambition. Some people make money their primary ambition. Others make business and their business lives. Or a specific goal their primary ambition. But suppose you get to heaven one day and you are standing before the Lord and you made more money than King Solomon in its all his glory. And you stand in front of the Father and he says to you, what did you do with your life? He said, Lord, I made more money than anyone ever did. What would the Lord say? Wow, that's amazing. Maybe we can play Monopoly for eternity here because there's no worth in heaven. That currency in heaven has no worth. What am I saying? Don't make your secondary ambition the primary goal. Our primary goal should be to seek the kingdom of God and all its righteousness. Money is good, don't get me wrong. Money is a blessing. What you can do with money is amazing. If God has blessed you with money, bless you. But for all of us, I would love to encourage yourself, be determined to be the most generous giver that you know. Because generosity and generous giving is really liberating. Jesus even said that. He said it's much more blessed to give than to receive. Become a generous, become the most generous person that you know. Also, we give God our time, we give God our money, we give God our ambitions and also our words. And Proverbs 12 verse 28 says, The word of the reckless pierces like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. We have to understand that our words carry so much power. It carries so much power. With one word, you can wreck someone's day. With one word, you can wreck someone's life. But I want to encourage you this morning to not speak death, but to speak life. To use that one word to speak a blessing over someone else. To see the good in them and to speak a blessing into their lives. You know, it's free. It doesn't cost us anything to speak life. With our mouths, do we put people down or do we encourage them? With our ears and our eyes, do we look and listen to stuff that builds us up or that breaks us down? With our hands, do we use them to take or do we use them to give and serve? Paul says, present your body as a living sacrifice. And the extraordinary paradox here is that we think that as soon as we do this, we will lose our freedom. St. Augustine said this, he said, his service, serving God, is perfect freedom. So this is actually the way to gain true freedom. I found this in my personal life. The more I've been serving the Lord, the more I've been seeking his face, the freer and freer and freer I feel. So Paul says, present your body as a living sacrifice. And that means that there will be a cost, unfortunately. There will be a cost for us, and that means there will also be lots of challenges in our lives. That means we will have to break with the past. That means that we will need to leave the rubbish on the rubbish dump and not go back there, but to take hold of the treasures that God has for us. 
That also means not to conform to the crowd, but to stand out, not to be a chameleon and blend in. Tomorrow morning when you get to work and you're around the coffee machine and someone asks you, hey, how was your weekend? Normally church is the last thing that we would say or even we won't even mention it at all. But maybe tomorrow take a different stance. And if someone asks you, how was your weekend? To say, hey, church was amazing yesterday. Two things will happen. The guy will walk away very quickly or he will listen to you. And you can say, have you ever been to New Life Church? Because I truly believe this is the greatest church in the world. Come on now. And if he listens to your story or she listens to your story, maybe give them an invite to come through next weekend. So the point is, why do we do this? I'm ending with this. Point number three, why do we do it? Why should we do it? Why should we present our bodies as a living sacrifice? To the Lord. Paul says, in view of God's mercy and in view of everything that God has done for you, that is why. That is why we do it. Jesus sacrificed his life for you and I so that we might live. He loved you so much that he died for you. And in response this morning, we say, Lord, here I am. Here is my body as a living sacrifice. I give it to you. Knowing that my life is so much in so much safer hands than in my own hands when it's in your hands. Amen. You see, I trust God with everything when I present my body to him, my whole life to him. And what does Paul say? He says, when you do that, you find out what God's will is for your life. What God's pleasing and perfect will is for your life. The devil this morning is trying to tell you that God is a spoiled sport. That he wants, God wants to ruin the rest of your life. You cannot trust God, the devil would say to you. He's going to ruin your life. God's going to take away all the fun in your life. You will have no fun anymore. But Paul says no ways. No, no, that's not true. His purpose for you this morning is good. That's what his word says, Romans 12. His purpose for you, it is pleasing It will please you and it is perfect. You cannot improve on God's plan for your life. You need to hear that this morning. Because Jesus said, I came that you might have life and wow, life so abundantly. Life in all of its fullness. You see, and when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, we discover God's good, pleasing and perfect will for our lives. A life as it's meant to be lived, a life worth living following Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Lord, there is truly none like you. There's truly none like you. Even though you know the worst of me, my very worst thought, the very darkest part of my being, still you send your son to this world to die for my life. There is none like you. Grace abounds where you are. It doesn't matter what I've done yesterday. It doesn't matter what I've done with my life. You make all things work together for my good and you turn it around and you have given me a future and a hope and a destiny and a purpose. There is none like you, Lord. There is none like you. Just for a moment, we ask the Holy Spirit What is he trying to say to you through this word this morning? Maybe there's something that you need to lay down. Maybe something that you have to break the past. You need to break it off. Leave it behind. Leave it in last year. Step into this new year in the victory of Jesus. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. By His grace, He comes and saves us. By His grace, He comes and changes our lives forever. Before we take communion this morning and we just dedicate this new year to the Lord, I would just love to lead you in a prayer if you have never received Jesus as the Lord and Savior in your life. Or maybe this morning you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Saying that I lived my life for Christ, but you know, I slipped a bit.
But this morning, I want to stand up again. And as a community, as a church, I would love for us just to pray together. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you are prepared to die on a cross for me. Knowing all my faults, knowing all my failures, you still came and did this for me. This morning, Lord, I give you my life as a living sacrifice laying it before you. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you will come and live in me, that you will come and reign in me. I declare you being my Lord and my Savior, the King of my life, the Lord of my life. I belong to you. I turn my back on the world. I turn my back on the past. I break with the past this morning. And I'm excited about a future in and through you, Jesus. Thank you for calling me your son and your daughter. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody says, amen. This is nothing like the presence of the Lord. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And this morning as we... As so we stand with the emblems, we we'll sit with our emblems in our hands. We have an opportunity to say to the Lord, Lord, I want to invite you into this here. I want to invite you into this next decade of my life. Today I break with the past. I break with whatever baggage I was carrying from the previous decade. But today I make a decision to walk into this new decade in victory. Knowing that there is healing in the name of Jesus. There's freedom in the name of Jesus. There is salvation, hope in the name of Jesus. And that is what we want, Lord. We want you. We want you. In Luke 22, we read Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said to his disciples, this is my body, bruised and broken for your transgressions. This morning, Father, if there's any sickness in us, any pain, any unforgiveness, we ask that you will free us from anything that keep, that's keeping us bound. We thank you for your body. We thank you that by your stripes we are healed. This morning as we partake, Father, we thank you for the victory that we have in Jesus because of your sacrifice. Let's partake together. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. On the same day Jesus took the cup, he says, this is my blood, the cup of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. And this morning, Lord, we thank you that it is your blood that washes us whiter than snow. That it's not our works, it's not what we do that makes us whole, but it's you. It's you who changes us. It's you who makes us whole. As you partake this morning, Father, we thank you that you have forgiven us a multitude of sins and that the best is yet to come for us. In Jesus' mighty name, let's partake together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.